during the summer. Mm. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be fun to stay here and uh, work? Mm -hmm. So I went to Post, which was, of course, the dominating paper of the whole mm -hmm. area Denver out there, Post. Denver Post. And uh, they had a, a woman that has been a tradition in journalism, Frances Wayne, as mm -hmm. their uh, sob sister, they called us most of the women in those days. <laughs> And uh, so they, were, they weren't about to take on an inex unexperienced person. And, uh, but the editor was nice enough to tell me that if I'd go over to the Denver Express, I might get a job. Mm -hmm. That was a Scripps Howard paper, and it published mm -hmm. uh, six days a week. So I went over and applied. And I said, I'd, I started downgrading myself. I have thought of that many times because um, I said, well, I've never been to journalism school. <laughs> And he said, well, good. <laughs> Most old editors in those days did say good. That's right. right. He said, we want to train our own people. Mm -hmm. He said, when can you start work? And mm -hmm. I said, well, right now, I'm so starting your, time. Your first assignment was that of sort of an Ann Landers type column? Yes, was it was. We Lord called it the Lovelorn column. And, mm -hmm. and it, the Scripps Howard people had the Cynthia Gray as their um, name for all the Lovelorn columns and all their papers. They were locally done, but they were um, under the Cynthia Gray name, so I became Cynthia Gray. Oh, I see. And um, they also told me that they wanted uh, me to uh, uh, write features, mm -hmm. and I did. I even, uh, during the summer, I uh, did some work at the State House and, and then some of the courthouses, which mm -hmm. were uh, at the courthouse, pardon me, which was a wonderful experience for me. Incidentally, when I got that job, I was following uh, Helen Laverty. And Helen Laverty later came here on the uh, uh, Bixby paper, which was the news that had just been bought by them. And the it's an old Republican, Daily news. Yes, yeah. the Springfield Daily News. And we had not met at all. Mm -hmm. And when I found, I knew, I knew her brother in Denver. He came in the editorial room very often. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, so when I found that uh, she was going coming, I said, well, I know that girl because I took her job. Mm -hmm. She had already gone to a Cleveland to a larger and more important job with the uh, Scripps Howard people. She went from Denver to Cleveland, to and, Cleveland then back to and then back to Springfield. I see. And she didn't like Cleveland very well. So um, uh, it was very odd that the two of us, and she wrote under the name of Dosha Carroll, they, uh, the Bixby papers wanted uh, the reporters to use pseudonyms. Did you use a pseudonym? Yes, the right at the uh, beginning, I wrote the, I used the name Celia Ray, and I hated it because there were so many people knew me by Lucille Morris, and, and I felt anything. silly. They wondered why I was writing the name Celia Ray. Mm -hmm. It wasn't long until they allowed me to take my own name, which was bad. But the name Celia stuck in a way and that that's the yes. name you now use with this Well, it concept. had been uh, more or less of a nickname before uh -huh. and when they uh, tried to give me a name. I did don't. George Olds give you that name or how did you Yes, yeah. uh, he gave that name to me. He said, you're going to have to take another name. And I said, what? I said, but everybody knows me by my name, real, real name. And he said, well, uh, don't you have a nickname? I said, Celia. And he said, Ray for Celia. And it became <laughs> Celia Ray. He, he named you then at that yeah. point. And, and uh, Dosha Carroll, had, had she been using the name Dosha Carroll in Cleveland? Or no. did she pick that up here? No, uh, I so that was a Bixby. Uh, the, the, everybody had to have a pseudonym right in the beginning. I see. If you remember, um, um, Max Boyd had the name uh, Felix Flanagan. Mm -hmm. And Dick Terry was uh, Alan Oliver. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the, everybody had a look at it, but they, they quit that after. Except that Dosha had been so accepted on the name Dosha Carroll, she had a good change. Yeah, she had that name. Uh, many okay. of us, I, I remember seeing her copy, it always had Laverty up in the corner. For a long time I couldn't understand why she was putting Laverty yeah. when obviously, you know, she was Dosha Carroll. And later I well, learned from somebody that it was Helen Laverty. After, uh, this sounds unreasonable, but it happened, and I, it's actually a true story. But after they tried to change us back to our real names, Dosha, for about a month, I suppose, wrote on the name of Helen Laverty. Hmm. And actually, I heard a reader, she said it to me, she says, I don't know who, 
that Helen Laverty is, but she's not as good as Bill Shapiro. We all kept her. <laughs> Yeah. And I suppose the editors heard the same thing, and they changed the back. Yeah, so, uh, your your experience as a newswoman, you mentioned you started out writing the Lovelorn column and so yes. forth, but you didn't ever write a Lovelorn column in Springfield, or no, did you? No, no, I never did. No, that uh, Lovelorn column was a very important tradition with the, uh, with Scripps, the Howard. Scripps Howard papers. And of course, my old paper later was um, uh, the Scripps Howard bought the Daily News there in uh, Denver, mm -hmm. and they were consolidated, and the Scripps Howard paper in Denver now is the News. Mm -hmm. And um, So the Rocky Mountain News. Rocky Mountain right? News, mm -hmm. that's right. Mm -hmm. And the uh, editor of it was a young man, he was very young, that I worked with there. Uh, was it there that you did the interview with Warren Harding? In, yes. In Denver? Uh, my very first in good story, and I hadn't been there very long, they assigned me, um, President Harding uh, came through Denver and stopped at least overnight, he was there a little while, on his final trip, the last trip he ever took, he was on his way to Alaska, and his wife was with him, and um, on his, um, and if you remember, he uh, became ill on the trip, came back to San Francisco and died. Mm -hmm. Well, he was all right when he hit Denver, and uh, I was so thrilled when they assigned me to cover the um, church service he was going to attend on Sunday morning. It was at a Presbyterian church there close to um, Capitol Hill, and um, I had never covered such an important story. I had never seen a president. And um, they gave me a police guard, which meant that I could go right through the police line. That was something I never had experienced. So there I was, just absolutely overwhelmed. And um, I got, I could sat right behind the president, in the pew right behind him. And um, as we went in, I, I heard Mrs. Uh, uh, Harding say, uh, Warren, don't walk so fast. And I thought, isn't that wonderful to hear a president's wife talk to him like that? <laughs> Give me orders. Well, he told, she, she told him to slow down. That, yes. that he, that he was that talking he was going, too fast for you. He was going too fast. Uh -huh. yeah. when you and uh, so that afternoon, that Sunday afternoon, and we didn't publish on Sunday. So I couldn't wait to get that story written. I just couldn't wait. I don't know if I ate lunch before I went into the office or not. I doubt it. But I went in that office as fast as I could, and uh, I sat with the typewriter, and I could not stop. I couldn't write a line. I knew all this old formula we had, which I believe they're dropping now somewhat, because sometimes I don't know where the stories are, the place, the location of them. Who, what, where, when, why. Yes, it was who, where, what, when, and why. Mm -hmm. And I knew that. But I, even with all that uh, organization, I still couldn't start my story. And I got the best training, the best training in journalism that afternoon that I ever had in my life. I was sitting there just, uh, just overwhelmed. And a very fine newspaper man that was on our desk came in. And he saw me in the collapsing stage. <laughs> and he said, what's the matter with you? And I said, I cannot write this story. I just really cannot. And he said, what's the matter? And I said, well, I can't write it. And he said, now, nah. he said, if you were writing a letter to your mother, you wouldn't have any trouble telling her what happened, would you? And I said, no, and I write lots of letters to her. And he said, well, write a letter to your mother. And of course, I didn't do it that way, but I got myself unwound. Mm -hmm. And I realized that what I needed to do was put down what had happened so the readers would know what had happened, and if I were writing it to my mother, I'd have to tell her all those things. And it just unwound immediately. And that was the best thing that was ever said to me, the best direction anybody ever gave me on how to write. And it's interesting that you're still writing letters. And the, the, yes. the journalism that you're doing now, the regular column in the news and leader, is a letter <laughs> from Celia to her aunt. And I, had vision, I had envisioned that. Uh, it's an interesting kind of... Uh, I think how that's worked out. How many years have you been writing the column uh, on, on Springfield 50 years I, uh, ago? I started that in, uh, in 1942. So I long. was uh, not employed by the paper regularly then. I had, uh, I had married in uh, 36 and quit the paper. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
the uh, when the war came on, they were just out. They just needed help so badly. They kept telling me, uh, "Come on down and, and join the staff again. We need you badly." Mm -hmm. uh, there had been a time they wouldn't have had me on the staff because I was married. They wouldn't let any married woman mm -hmm. work on the staff. But they really begged me to come, and I said, "Well, I just cannot. I, uh, I, I cannot come back because uh, my husband wasn't well." And uh, I was needed at home, I thought. So I finally said, well, I'll write your column. And uh, George Little said, well, what's it going to be about? And I said, well, it's not going to be about the war. I want an antidote for the war. Mm -hmm. So I figured out this 50-year-ago thing. And I took it down. And, or rather, I sent it down with my husband one morning. And uh, I wrote a little note to Mr. Olds, and I said, uh, now, this is not what you want, but maybe it'll give you an idea of what I can do to, uh, to fit in with what you want. Mm -hmm. But he didn't say a word, and he never sent me a note, called me or anything. And the next Sunday morning, it was in the paper, and it's been running ever since. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember I was down and wrote a story for him when I was applying for a job, and I didn't know how I had come out on that either until I saw it in the paper the next day. I reckon, <laughs> recognized, well, I must have the job because he printed the story. I never word, you know, until much, much years later yes. that he started talking to yes. me. But, but uh, other than in, uh, in sort of grunts and, and uh, you know, some uh, uh, expletives and so forth yes. that come about in terms of not quite meeting the standards. And he, right. was, a, he was a very, very stern teacher, yes. but one that, that right. uh, we all benefited a great deal from. Okay. Well, on, on the uh, uh, the column that you've been doing, that's been a long, a long assignment every week for. Oh yes, all these and many I years. never, I never dreamed that it'd go on that long. I was just trying to help out down the halls. Yeah, and then later you you helped out with uh, with some other assignments. Uh, the church page. You said you did the church well, page. Well, uh, yes. Now uh, during the, uh, you remember we had a fire, and uh, I. Um, went down, they just, they just needed help desperately. I've forgotten what year that was. Yeah, 1947, I think. Uh, March of 1947. Seems I thought it was early in that. I, it, was, I, it was while my husband's still alive and he died. Well, it might have been. That's before he died. Before. Yeah, I That's think. probably just before he died then. And uh, so I went down and did the... Uh, that is true because I did most of the work at home. Mm -hmm. I told him I'd take over the church page. Mm -hmm. And I did that and did my calling at home. But, and uh, because they had no phones operating at the office, you see. Well, and, I, I remember the date real well because that was the first time I ever got fired. Was, uh, uh, they laid off a lot of us yes. who were on the night shift yes. because they went to one paper a day were publishing it in Tulsa and That's shipping right. it back and That's forth. Right. And you, you right. came in about that. And, uh, and they had that church page. Somebody had to uh, have a telephone to uh, do it, and I did that work at home. I remember then I would take my copy down to the mm -hmm. uh, to the Then you came office. back on the staff and were doing all kinds of assignments, uh, murders, and uh, just about everything that happened. And well, in fact, uh, you did a lot of those in connection with Betty Love, who was a photographer yeah, at the newspaper yeah. for a long time. And she was telling me one day she thought that they sort of sent uh, you, you and Betty off on a lot of those assignments because the, most of the, the, the uh, men reporters were married and had small families, and they thought, well, we'll just send uh, uh, Betty and Lucille on that assignment. So you drew some very, very uh, dangerous and tricky assignments. Well, uh, uh, most of them were just uh, by chance. Now, and now I remember one time uh, uh, they were building Table Rock Dam. Now, I was on regularly, a regular reporter then, mm -hmm. and I was also doing a column called um, Over the Old Sox. And on top of that, I was doing the Sunday column. I was working six days a week, so mm -hmm. that's everybody uh, did then. Yeah. And um, I remember this. They uh, assigned us to go down to uh, the junction of the James and the White River. And uh, we were to um, take pictures of the old uh, the old cemetery, it later was, it was moved mm -hmm. when the water mm -hmm. came up, but the water hadn't come up from the dam yet. And they, the old Philibert Cemetery, uh, mm -hmm. Philibert was a, uh, a man who had come out of St. Louis, he was kin to the Chotos, and he had this trading post down there and traded with the Indians. And um, it was, um, uh, he, he, he was quite a character. 
And uh, he and his wife and several members of the family were buried in this little plot, mm -hmm. which has now been moved there, uh, oh, off the highway, the old highway into Branson, the Philibury Cemetery. So uh, Marvin Tong, who then was um, working with the Boy Scouts here, I don't know whether he was head of the, uh, whether he was the executive. He was a field executive. Uh, is he that what it was? Well, he was executive. going down that day to uh, Arkansas for some big, uh, dress up thing they were having and he had told betty and me if we ever wanted to go down there he would guide us to that place mm -hmm. well we met him down there at uh, oh the juncture on uh, uh, i've forgotten the old well when you used to turn off to go to weed springs and uh, he was all dressed up in his boy scout badges and all his regalia mm -hmm. so he he drove ahead of us and led us to this uh, a place where there had been a bridge across James. <laughs> and it had been floated out just a few days before in a regular flood. It wasn't the backwater from the uh -huh. uh, lake yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't know what to do. And there were some fishermen on this side. And they said, well, you can't get across there because uh, it's, mm -hmm. it was quite deep, the water was. And uh, I don't know whether they suggested it or whether um, Betty and Marvin thought it up. But they said, well, we can cross uh, further up. It mm -hmm. was going to be a 50-mile trip if we had to go all the way around and come in mm -hmm. on the other side. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, uh, we went up there, and uh, that water was above the knees. And <laughs> Betty said, well, I can wade that. And I said, well, I'm not going to wade it. <laughs> and Mom said, oh, come on, let's go in there. And uh, it just happened that I had a camera with me. I, mm -hmm. For some reason, I carried my own camera that day. I don't know why. And uh, when we got um, uh, in the middle of that water, why Betty was there taking my picture and Marvin's picture wading the water. Yeah. We did look silly. And I was holding up my notebook and my camera and everything. So I just stopped. The water was up to my waist. I just stopped right there and got my camera and took a picture of her and Marvin. <laughs> And that was the best picture we got, really. But we went across, and um, then luckily, and we got some good pictures up, uh, some interesting and historical pictures up on that hill. Mm -hmm. And uh, where the Indians had been, we found some Indian uh, old fragments of the arrowheads and things mm -hmm. like that. And then uh, on the way back, while I was beginning to dread have to wade that river again, and we looked up, and here was a couple that had one time lived in Springfield, and they were now living, then living in uh, Kansas City. Mm -hmm. And they were floating down the river as a last float because they liked to do that. Mm -hmm. And they, they took us across. So everything That's, turned out well there. It's very good. You, you did do a lot of very dangerous assignments of all sorts along the ground. Well, as I remember, good. and this was something I think the office didn't know we were going to get into such trouble. We uh, were assigned to uh, meet the Missouri Pacific train at Crane on the last run of the passenger train mm -hmm. down into Arkansas. And um, as we left the, uh, there, and there was an ice storm that night, oh, things were slick. And the icicles were hanging from everywhere. And um, we got out on that road and we didn't know whether we were gonna live to get anywhere or not. We couldn't, we couldn't turn around, we couldn't do anything. It was as slick as could be. So, uh, we grumbled about it, but we finally decided we'd just well go on because it couldn't be any worse. And when we got to Crane, one of the uh, officials of the uh, Missouri Pacific uh, knew we were expecting to meet the train there, and mm -hmm. he was there, and we got aboard the train and um, made the trip, last trip for this passenger train, and we got down into those tunnels in Arkansas. Mm -hmm with the icicles hanging from the entrances of them, and it was the prettiest sight I ever saw. Mm -hmm. And they would stop the train for Betty to get out and take Thank pictures you. of those uh, tunnels with the icicles uh, mm -hmm. dripping down. It was lovely. We had a lot of memorable uh, uh, experiences, I'm sure, as a reporter for the News and Leader. You later then did get into politics. How did that ever happen? That they, they, you, you, you uh, were involved with the city council? And, uh, well, that was, that was after I had retired. I see. Uh, when I retired, why, um, I was, uh, Dr. Suter Smith, who had been the councilwoman, 
had announced that she was going to retire. She mm -hmm. wasn't going to, that does her last year. And um, I, it seems to me that she was at this dinner. I was at a dinner with some of my friends, mm -hmm. and um, she, uh, uh, one of them says, well, why don't you run for office? You're not doing a thing. You know when you retire, you're not <laughs> doing anything. Everybody thinks you aren't doing anything. And I said, oh, no, I couldn't go on the council. And they said, well, you, no reason why you can't. You know mm -hmm. the... You know about city government because you've been covering those offices so long. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, I said, well, I'm not going to campaign. Nobody had to campaign for office, uh, for city council, and you didn't. Mm -hmm. Well, you never heard of it. So um, they said, well, we'll carry the petitions for you. You, had, you did have to have petitions signed. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this, group, this group got enough names on the petitions and filed my name. And I never ask anybody for a vote, and I don't, I don't believe any other councilman did. I don't think we did in those days. And as for putting up any money to run for it, it never, it never occurred to me. I just, mm -hmm. the, the idea. How long were you on the council then? Four years, Four years. that's all. You, you did make quite a contribution, though, I think, that should be acknowledged at that time in working to save many of the historic sites that... Uh, uh, and, and getting uh, the community in, uh, interested in saving some of the sites and getting them marked and so forth. I'm sure that was uh, uh, a rewarding kind of thing. I mean, uh, personally... Uh, it was rewarding the way people responded to it. Mm -hmm. I, it was just wonderful. And um, whenever I hear people complain about um, uh, councilmen going to these meetings of the uh, uh, National Council of Cities, Mm -hmm. I think I wish they could know more about how much the council will learn there. Mm -hmm. our, our council met in uh, San Diego, and uh, when we got there, the first thing they asked us was, what is your interest? Mm -hmm. And I said history, mm -hmm. local history is what mm -hmm. I said. So they immediately called the man that was in charge of the uh, San Diego, uh, uh, the San Diego um, uh, historical Museum uh, no, the no. whole works there. Oh, just, uh, he was uh -huh. just head of the whole thing. And he had been with the uh, uh, Historical Society of Missouri hmm. and had been editor of the uh, Quarterly. And I, I knew him quite well. Oh, I see. So he immediately called me and he said, if you're interested in history, I'll just show you. So mm -hmm. he took me around to their various uh, uh, wonderful historical uh, mm -hmm. preservations and attractions and things. Job. And then he said, do you have a, a historical site board in Springfield? I said, no, I don't want anything about a historical site board. He said, well, we have one here that's very effective. And I'll get, their, uh, I'll get the ordinance that created it and send it to you. Mm -hmm. And he did that. And I had it retyped and introduced it in our council. And it was adopted, and that began our historical site. Well, that was a real accomplishment, and obviously something that grew out of a meeting. It uh, was, yes, something. that's right. Yes. And uh, I was always very happy about it because uh, the community, the council, and the uh, community all responded wonderfully, and still does. We have a fine board right now. And I think the uh, one of the uh, another honor that was uh, that was bestowed on you about a year or so ago was when you were initiated into the. Uh, uh, Greater Ozarks uh, Hall of Fame at, uh, at the Ralph Foster Museum, and I think that, uh, that was quite overwhelming. And of really course, I'm very appreciative of it. That was that for was all wonderful. that you've done uh, for local history in, in Springfield through your column and through your active interest as a member of the city council. I think uh, it was certainly a, a long overdue. Well, uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I've I've been very appreciative of it, of course, and been quite overwhelmed by. It. I think the, 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 the hold that you have on Springfield history and the kind of background you have uh, has been a, a valuable resource to many other reporters, uh, including this one, over the years. To be able to call Lucille and, and ask her, you know, whether this happened in that year or the other year, is just a, it's just a marvelous uh, uh, role that, you, that well. you still continue to play, in addition to doing your column every Sunday. I think, well, I think it's marvelous. And, when you said a while ago that you had retired, I, I didn't believe it for a minute that you ever had retired. You, you, I guess you really left full-time yes, work at the paper, but you right. certainly have not retired uh, <laughs> not very much. Well, anymore. I continued that column, and that's the only uh, carryover that I mm -hmm. had. Mm -hmm. 
But uh, of course, I, I've done lots of features of paper since, you know, uh -huh. just assigned, special assignments. And I, I think that's, uh, that is an important thing, to be able to share the background that you have sort of uh, earned and learned uh, in terms of the, the history of the community is one thing that's, uh, that's yeah. very, very I've important. I've been very grateful I could share it because yeah, uh, yeah. it's wonderful how people have responded, and I, I do appreciate it. I'm sure it. you get a lot of reader response to your column yes. and questions and, and comments about it because people yes. do love to hear about the past and some of the things. And that I have consciously tried to um, use as many parallel events as I can. For mm -hmm. instance, it's surprising um, how many things that were happening 50, 50 years ago are happening in a different uh, form right now. And uh, I'm, uh, it, it, it's always interesting to me. And, and I think you do an excellent job of, of uh, placing that in context with with current things that are happening, uh, I, people uh, find it very interesting. I uh, enjoy doing that because... And uh, the uh, the cartoons that used to appear, in oh, uh, Bob, Scott Shadburn did, and Bob Palmer and then did. Bob Shadburn and then Bob Palmer. I, I was, was oh, the, those, uh, those were wonderful. Bob Palmer was just wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I just, um, I was sad when uh, we had to drop the cartoon. Because that did add a lot of, uh, very interesting dimension and probably attracted some younger readers. Oh, I used to mind. tell Bob, I said, I wasn't through a cartoon, it's column, nobody paid attention to it. <laughs> well, it's a marvelous job. So, I think all of us, uh, you know, salute you as a journalist who has contributed a great deal to the community in many, many different ways. And we appreciate you taking your time to come here and visit with us today on Springfield Profiles. That well, doesn't time fly when you're having fun. It really does. <laughs> it really goes Well, thank really you. I've, I've enjoyed coming.